Welcome to Google Meet. Enter the meeting pin followed by the pound key. Thank you. You are joining a call with more than four people. Please mute your phone.
Hey everybody, this is Chris over here at the DO. We're trying to figure out which board members are inside this meet. If you could unmute and let us know, we'd appreciate it. Jonathan's here. Bethany is here. David's here. And Tom is here. Joan, are you here? This is Craig. I'm in by telephone. Yeah, this is John Silva. I'm in by telephone too, but I have no uh, visual. Do we have visual on this? I'm not certain where we've been admitted yet. Oh, okay. Somebody's got a letter then. Yeah, you're in. I hear you both. Go to your screen. We just want to thank everybody for their patience. Board members, we're going to have um, Linda Marsh do roll call again, um, but we're going to have our board president start us in open session. Good evening. This meeting is being held pursuant to Executive Order N-2920, issued by California Governor Gavin Newsom on March 12, 2020. Any or all board members may attend the meeting by phone. Members of the public may attend at the Fairfield Sassoon Central Office, 2490 Hillborn Road, Calif uh, Fairfield, California, to observe and provide public comment during the meeting. Board members will state their name when they make the motion and when they make the second. All votes will be recorded via roll call format. Uh, we are, can we have, Should we have the roll call first and then yes, the please. Pledge of Allegiance? Chantel Martino? Here. Mrs. Gott? Mrs. Honeychurch? Here. Mr. Isom? Here. Mr. Richardson? Here. Mr. Silva? Here. Ms. Smith? Here. And Mr. Wilson? Here. Excellent. Okay, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, United States of America and to the republic, and for, which republic stands, for which stands one nation under God, nation, under God individual, individual for liberty and justice for all. Superintendent Corey, could you please give us uh, a report on the action taken in closed session? Thank you, President Honeychurch. In the matter of conference with labor negotiators, there was no action taken. In the matter with conference with legal counsel anticipated litigation, the board gave the superintendent direction to settle an anticipated litigation matter involving personnel. In the matter of employee discipline dismissal um, release, I'm sorry, no action was taken, but in it's very I'm pleased to announce that by unanimous vote, our board has officially appointed Colleen Hutchinson as the principal of the Virtual Academy, effective immediately. Yay. And our Google is down, so I don't have my paper about Colleen, so I'm just going to have to talk about Ms. Hutchinson and just say that she has been a member of our administrative team most recently, serving as the assistant principal at Fairview. She has been a teacher in our district. And she stepped up to start our virtual academy, which boomed to 500 students. And she has been doing an excellent job. She hired 20 teachers and continues to um, do a fine job. 
Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to communication presentations. Student uh, representative reports is Jasmine Allen from Fairfield High School online or on the phone? Here. Would you like to give your report now, please? Oh, the video, but we can't see the video. I'm not sure how to present. We're gonna play. Okay, Jasmine, they're gonna play the video. Okay, great. Good evening, Board President Honey Church, members of the Governing Board, Superintendent Corey, and members of the community. I am Jasmine Allen, Fairfield High School's 2020 to 2021 ASB President. Today, I would like to share what is occurring at FHS, including freshman orientation, back to school night, community service events, and how distance learning is proceeding for staff and students. Freshman orientation videos were created by the freshman class advisors and uploaded to YouTube. They were also posted on Google Classroom that freshmen could access by clicking the links to watch videos explaining the campus and Fairfield High School's culture. There was even a virtual campus tour that highlighted important areas on the campus. The first community service event planned by Fairfield High's leadership class was a community service gift card donation drive for the NorCal fire victims. Leadership students volunteered to come out in front of FHS and hold signs and buckets so that cars driving by could donate gift cards that are now being distributed to the local victims of the NorCal fires. We have six families we are assisting with all the donations that total to $1,200. Distance learning is going well for this school year so far. I sent out a Google form that was shared with both staff, students, asking for their feedback on their thoughts about virtual learning. The majority of students' respondents think distance learning is challenging. Most students and staff said that it is strange and hard getting used to missing out on the social aspects of school. Some people also believe that it is hard to grasp the concepts of what they need to learn and need to refocus their work ethic in this environment to ensure everything is done and turned on on time. As time goes on, students will acclimate to distance learning. For back to school night, teachers uploaded videos and or slideshows introducing themselves and procedures for their classroom into their Google Classroom for parents to view. The slides have included information about the teachers, class syllabus, and protocol to follow inside the classroom. To conclude, I look forward to presenting for the board again because we are planning more virtual events to create a more memorable year. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Jasmine. Next, we have Maximiliano Gonzalez Barba from the Early College High School. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, good evening, Superintendent Corey, Board President Honeychurch, members of the Governing Board, and members of the public. My name is Maximiliano Gonzalez Barba, and I'm an early college high school senior, also a member of the FSU at the end of the chapter. Um, I prepared a short video to share how a school year has started, if you got that point. Thank you. Our students take their high school classes simultaneously alongside their Somalo community college courses. There's a large range of college courses that our students can take. 
and there's really something out there for everybody. Okay. As we okay. All know, Maximilian. Unfortunately, and we're having some technical difficulties, so we're going to put you on next board agenda. Okay. Okay. So we'll try. We'll try. Uh, should, we, should we try? Uh, student board member Daniel Westover from Fairfield Sassoon Adult School. Let's I'm see, Daniel Westover. Here. I'm from the adult school. And I would just like everybody to know if you're talking about getting your diploma or your GED, I want to let you know talk is cheap. Put it into action. Get up there. Go see the teachers. They're awesome. They're supportive, kind, and they will. They've got this. They will put you in the right places that you need to be in order to get your GED and your diploma. Thank you. Thank you. I did it myself. I waited way too long and I'm, I'm glad I'm up there now and I'm taking care of business now that I should have taken care of a long time ago, but I had kids at a young age. And um, I took care of my kids and I raised my kids. And I put them through school. I had uh, my kids went to uh, Army High School and they're gra graduates of Army High. And um, I graduated them and one went off into the military and the other one went off to work for the railroad. And I have another daughter that's working for Lowe's at this time. And, you know, I fired less. And I persevered. It was always something that I wanted to have, but I couldn't achieve it. So I always pushed my kids to do it and they've done it and they've made successes out of themselves. And now it's my turn to make success for myself as well. So I am very grateful to be here and to be able to represent the adult school. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on, Moving on to four uh, uh, B, B presentation, presentation, the update on the five-phase five continuum, continuum plan. plan. Uh, do we, uh, have, do any we have any public speakers, speakers on this side of There are. Uh, are there public speakers? You're going to have to announce them because I don't have access. Okay. Okay. So for 4B, we have Rebecca Grasty. Do we have, do we have, are we doing it here or are we doing it out in the lobby? Up here, up here. So I think, so I think you go over there, sorry. Before you get started, could I ask the people who have called in to please mute? Thank you. What's the keystroke to mute? You should be able to see it on your phone. Start six. I'm on an old fashioned phone. Star six. Oh my gosh. Put your hand over the microphone. Okay, okay, go ahead. Go ahead. All right. Hi, everyone. Nice to see, nice you, to again. see you again. Unfortunate, unfortunate, unfortunate conversing, conversing with you under these circumstances. circumstances. 
I was disheartened part when, when as early as August 14th, 14th, 14th it was announced that schools in counties, in counties regardless of being on the watch list or not or any other restrictions of COVID metrics, were given the were given green light, green light to, open to open for in-person in learning for special needs students. students. But FSUSD, but FSUSD I, was I was not not communicated, communicated with or notified, or notified if they had meaningful or identical, or identical steps with special, with special needs students to reference this. I understand, I understand this doesn't happen overnight, but, but we're now out, we're now of, the out of the most restricted tier. Could this not, could this be, not be more of a possibility? Distance learning, Distance for, learning the for the majority of students is discouraging, is discouraging. but adding but another, adding another layer of special needs, needs those, kids those kids are almost unreachable. unreachable. Distance, learning Distance learning is ineffective, is ineffective inefficient, inefficient, inadequate, inadequate, and inaccessible. For working for parents, parents licensed child care providers, providers attending, attending to the intimate diapering needs, eating care, and care. <laughs> more hours, more hours when school, when school uses, uses picking, up picking up the slack for being closed. Being closed. Kids are attending, Kids are attending various, various programs, programs for long, for long hours, hours at community at centers. Community centers. Naively, Naively, while earning while my earning own, my own credential, teaching credential, it never occurred to me I'd have to defend my children seemingly in opposition to my profession. School personnel, school personnel can't, say can't say they're doing, they're everything, doing everything to help the kids, kids but also, but also vote, vote to continue, continue distance, distance learning. learning. When contrary, when contrary wise, wise, experts, experts say the hazards, hazards of keeping, keeping children out of school, out of school outweigh, outweigh the hazards, the hazards of children attending school in person during this time, time with, with the concern of COVID. Additionally, additionally talking, in a, talking in a historical perspective, perspective a minute few of select schools, select schools in 2009, even though, even though there were periods, there were periods of more than 25 percent of the student body, body absent, 1,270 1, children alone in the U.S. died. Up to H1N, H1 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 one swine flu. 60,000, excuse me, 60 million, 60 million, cases, million cases were reported, were reported in, the in the United States, States. still kills still people today, today, according to the according CDC. To the CDC. During this, During this time, 435 teachers were pink slipped in the USD. It could possibly, could possibly be overshadowed, overshadowed in our memories. I could reference, I could reference the 1969 Hong Kong outbreak, outbreak, outbreak when adjusted, when adjusted for population, population percentages, percentages, the equivalent, the equivalent of 165,000 died. Or in 1957, the Asian flu outbreak, outbreak killing 225,400 people in today's standard side. Our students are suffering, but it's not a condition solved still. It'll be solved, It'll be solved in person, in person academic, academic education, education taught by the taught highly, by highly professional, professional, qualified teachers, teachers handleable resources. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there another, Is there another second, speaker? second speaker? No more speakers. No more, no more speakers. No more speakers. Okay. okay. I'll turn it I'll over turn it to Dr. McKay. So we're going so to attempt to do this. To do this Someone muted you. Press star six to unmute. You unmuted yourself. <laughs> I can hear myself, I can hear myself laugh. laugh. But, 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 uh, I believe this uh, Avlinius is, is also, also going, going to be joining us for part of this presentation. Of this presentation. Um, it will be, um, it will be interesting. interesting. She's not able to see it, so we're going to do it with me telling her what slide we're on, and hopefully we will all be in sync through that process. So good evening, Superintendent Corey, Board President Honeychurch, and members of the Governing Board. Tonight, Ms. Avlinius and I will be providing an update regarding our successes and challenges with Phase 1 of the five-phase continuum, as well as an update regarding the current county COVID status and its impact on reopening schools. Just as, a Just as a reminder in July, in July the board officially the board adopted, adopted a five-phase continuum plan that was based, that was based on, on guidance from many organizations, including, including the, California the California Department of Public Health, Cal, 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 Cal OSHA, and Solano County, 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 County Public Health. Health. Given, the Given the requirements, requirements set forth by the state, the board State's took board action that, that we could open school in phase one, distance learning. In order to provide consistency for our students, families, and staff, we communicated at the time that the district would remain in phase one at a minimum until October 16th. During our, During our July 16th, 16th Governing Board, Governing board meeting, meeting, one of the slides, of the slides indicated, indicated that things will change. Things will change. Well, well, that statement, that statement, that statement couldn't, be couldn't be proven more accurate. accurate. Before Ms. Avlinita shares the new state system for COVID monitoring and its impact on public schools, I wanted to take a few minutes to update the board on the silver linings as well as the challenges. 
COVID has forced us to reevaluate what's most important in our work and become much more focused on that which is most important. For example, in educational services, while we're working to respond to COVID, we also have three primary goals that we're focusing on, which include the implementation of multi-tier systems of support, our focus on equity, and the development of our principal pipeline. Ironically, although we are, many of us are working from distant places and our students are distance learning, we're finding that we're collaborating more, but in new formats. Elementary education and secondary education set up regularly scheduled drop-in virtual meetings where site leaders can quickly get answers to support the work that they're doing at the site. The virtual, the virtual professional development and virtual hiring processes are strategies that will most likely continue even after COVID. Finally, our parents are reporting increased engagement in activities such as back to school night, and we're seeing higher participation in certain student activities like our student advisory committee. <clears throat> During this time of COVID, we're grateful for our community partnerships, especially the one that's going to lead to child care support for our community. While it's taken longer than we had hoped, the city's program we anticipate will begin October 5th at 10 of our campuses from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. The program will support approximately 280 students district-wide. While there's, While there's been silver linings, there's also been a few challenges that we have been working to overcome. The lesson planning is very, takes a significant amount of time for our teachers to prepare high quality lessons for our students. In addition, we hear reports from parents and from students that we've not yet been successful at striking a balance between homework or asynchronous work being assigned when the student, and, and not only when it is assigned, but also when it is due. The social emotional needs are significant, and while we've added supports and services, we don't believe it's enough. We're continuing to look for options. For example, we met with a company yesterday whose sole purpose is to match students and families with community resources that are available to support the social emotional needs of our students within 72 hours. While we found new ways to communicate, we're also being overwhelmed by the communication stream. For example, staff are receiving hundreds of emails each day, significantly more than what they would receive when we were all in school. In addition to that, our families who are turning to email as a form of communication are frustrated by the lack of response or the delay in response. Finally, we have teams that are working to re-engage students, but they're finding some of the challenges hard to overcome. Those challenges include students getting kicked out of virtual classrooms. I think we all understand that after what we're experiencing this evening. Um, sometimes it's due to bandwidth and also feeling overwhelmed by the amount of homework or not feeling successful in the digital environment. While there's, been, While there's challenges, been challenges, we've also been able to make some adjustments through this process. We have changed our meeting structure for our site leaders by reducing the number of Monday meetings and adding these voluntary check-in meetings. We've also changed our attendance counting system three times. Um, the original accounting system was set up, and even the ones that we're following, in order to respond to the requirements set forth by the state and what we believe we have to submit to our auditors. The first set were very time consuming, and in fact, some of the school districts are still using what we were using two iterations ago. This morning, I was surprised to see an article in um, NPR regarding how challenging the attendance, attendance accounting system is for schools across the entire state. We do believe that the changes that we've made have been have helped make it easier, but we're not going to say that it's been easy. And these requirements are a result of what the governor and the state legislature put into place this summer regarding live daily interaction and being able to prove that we are providing 180 days of instruction with the minimum state required number of instructional minutes. Along with, Along with attendance accounting, we are faced with a new tracking system for our students with special needs to ensure that they are receiving the number of minutes outlined within their IEP. We do believe once we have a new system that we're setting up with attendance accounting, this will improve the system that we're having to use for tracking services for special education students. 
Finally, there, Finally, there were many challenges, and we spoke about this a little bit at our last governing board meeting with the administration of MAP, with really the most significant challenges taking place at our lower grades. We're in the process of gathering data from our administration about the administration of the assessment and forming a committee that we can make recommendations on how to support, better support staff and students when we take the next administration in January, February. I'd now like to introduce Ms. Avalon Edith, who will be discussing the new state monitoring system and its impact on schools. Before we do that, Dr. McCabe, I just want to ask if any of the people who are on the Google Meet, if you could just make sure that your microphone muted because we're picking up some serious feedback. So we just want to make sure everybody's microphone is muted before we have potentially new issues go on. Is that good? TSS, you got them muted? He's good. All right. Thank you. Did we mute at Ms. Avalonitis? Here. Oh, wonderful. Your turn, Angie. <laughs> wonderful. For everybody who is able to follow along, I'll let you know what slide I'm on so that you can follow along. We're on slide seven. As I mentioned, too, Solano County was placed on a state's watch list effective July 17th. And schools were required to begin the 2021 school year in distance learning. Six weeks later, by August 28th, the state changed directions and implemented stricter opening requirements, which Governor Gavin Newsom announced as the blueprint for a safer economy, which replaced the state's watch list. Solano County was initially assigned to the most restrictive tier, purple. As of Tuesday, September 22nd, Solano County has moved into red or tier two, a less restrictive tier. Should Solano County sustain in red for 14 consecutive days, schools can reopen at 100% for in-person instruction. Slide eight. The CDPH assesses weekly indicators and provides updates on Tuesdays. Rules of the framework permit movement to a less restrictive tier, one tier at a time. If the adjusted case rate and or positivity rate worsen, a county will be assigned the more restrictive tier. It is important to share with the board that the state has indicated a health equity measure will also be assessed, and we anticipate more information from the state related to this measure in the near future. Finally, the plan also includes an emergency break where the state can intervene more immediately for concerning factors like hospitalization. The next three slides will provide a brief overview of each four of the tiers. Slide nine. The purple or widespread tier is the most restrictive tier in our blueprint. Many non-essential indoor businesses are closed and data sets are the most restrictive. Slide 10. The red or substantial tier two is the second most restrictive tier. Some non-essential indoor businesses are closed and the data sets are less restrictive than in purple. Slide 11. Orange or moderate tier three permits some indoor businesses to be open with modifications. The data sets are less restrictive than the red, while the yellow or minimal tier four is the least restrictive tier in our blueprint. Slide 12. The major differences for schools are really between two tiers, purple and red. As a general rule of the blueprint, similar to the state's previous watch list, schools are not permitted to reopen for in-person instruction while in purple. Schools are permitted to reopen at 100% for in-person instruction once their county has been in red for at least 14 consecutive days. While in purple, schools with grades TK to six may open for in-person instruction if they apply for and receive a waiver from their local health department. Once in red, waivers are not required for in-person instruction. For schools applying for waivers from their local health department while their county is in purple, those schools are required to outline how they will implement surveillance testing. Once counties sustain in red for 14 consecutive days, surveillance testing is not required 
and schools should plan for how to respond to symptomatic persons. On July 17th, the CDPH provided cohorting guidance, then updated their guidance on September 4th, outlining what cohorting students in Tier 1 must look like. After sustaining in red for 14 consecutive days, based on the information we currently have, cohorting guidance will no longer be applicable. So what does cohorting in purple look like and how is it applied? Slide 13. CDPH defines a cohort as a stable group of no more than 14 children or youth and no more than two supervising adults or a configuration of no more than 16 individuals total in the cohort in a supervised environment in which supervising adults and children can stay together for all activities meals, recreation, et cetera, and avoid contact with people outside of their group in the setting. Our teachers may elect to pilot a cohort and are not required to do so. Cohorting specifically permits in-person instruction while in purple for prioritized students. While our students with disabilities should be prioritized, English learners, are students at high risk of further learning loss or students not partic participating in distance learning, our foster and homeless youth, and students at risk of abuse or neglect should also be prioritized. Slide 14. As long as the student maximum does not exceed 14 or does not exceed a configuration of no more than 16 individuals, a classroom teacher who elects to pilot a cohort while in purple has a great deal of flexibility. Examples of the cohorting are listed on the slide before you. For example, a classroom teacher may elect to provide and pilot in-person targeted intervention specialized support and services to a stable cohort maximum of 14 students. They may elect to work with seven students in the morning and seven students in the afternoon, or seven students on a Monday and seven students on Tuesday, or 14 students in the morning or in the afternoon, 14 students on any day, Monday through Friday, or a classroom teacher and three paraprofessionals may work with a maximum of 12 students, maybe four students on Monday, four students on Wednesday, and four students on a Friday. A classroom teacher may not provide targeted intervention and support to 14 students in the morning and a different group of 14 students in the afternoon. Slide 15. On July 17th, when we discovered we were on the state's watch list, Solano Public Health advised districts that athletic conditioning must cease immediately. By Friday, September 4th, this was reversed and Solano Public Health advised that athletic conditioning may occur. While the California Interscholastic Federation, or CIF, has determined this fall period to be summer, conditioning, not practicing, may occur. Further, public health advised that there may be no sharing of equipment and no playing of instruments due to the increase of droplets and potential spread of COVID-19. On Wednesday, September 9th, Kristen Witt, Jen Taylor, and I had our initial meeting with high school principals to discuss the Kalosha guidance related to youth sports. FSUSD has determined that youth sports guidance is germane to marching bands since our marching bands qualify as an interscholastic athletic program for administrative regulation 6142.7. After our collaborative meeting with our high school principals, we rolled out final written guidance on Tuesday, September 15th. Our high school principals in turn met with their respective athletic and band directors to discuss the Cal OSHA guidance, communication protocol, and steps that need to be taken to mitigate the spread of COVID-19. Ms. Witt, Paul Speed, and I will have a follow-up meeting with those principals tomorrow to discuss questions, concerns, and any new information or updates that we might have. 
While the Cal OSHA guidance defers to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or the CDC, for guidance on cohorting in athletics, the CDC is actually silent on the number of students permitted in a cohort. In Fairfield Sassoon, in order to ensure that we are mitigating exposure to COVID-19 while in purple, and until we have surpassed 14 consecutive days in red, we are following cohorting guidance that we discussed on the previous slide. Slide 16. To bring us back full circle, while the state has shifted to a blueprint for a safer economy and the four tiers, we learned just three days ago that schools can reopen at 100% for in-person instruction once their county has been in red substantial tier two for at least 14 consecutive days. In Solano County, we should know by Tuesday, October 6th, if this requirement has been met. Slide 17. We know for certain that things will change. We know that things are constantly changing. Decisions, however, will need to be made during the October 8th governing board meeting related to the opening of schools. Slide 18. Thank you all for your patience this evening. Dr. McCabe and I would like to thank you for your time this evening, and this time is now reserved for board discussion. Thank you. Uh, board members, at this point, uh, I would like to hear what you all are thinking right now about moving into in-person instruction as we're going to have to be making a decision shortly. And if you have any questions that you need to have answered before making a decision. And I'm not sure how I'm going to call on people. I see Craig and John. Um, uh, that's a good idea. We'll just go one at a time. Uh, Craig, would you like to go first? Yes, thank you. Um, it sounds like the at uh, what the state will permit us to be 100% two weeks from now, possibly. Uh, we're not planning on that abrupt. And uh, I notice there are significant community concerns. Um, and I hope that when we do loosen up, that we don't loosen up more than one phase at a time. Uh, and that we don't rush into it because we might have to rush back based on national or state or county region conditions. So I hope we just go cautiously, keeping in mind the most needy students. And uh, that those are my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Uh, Bethany, would you go next? Sure. Um, okay, so... I, one of my questions was, when did we go into the red? But I, I'm hearing uh, from Angie when that was. But so let's say we we surpass that 14 days. Um, what does it take for us to go back into the purple? And then if we suddenly go back into the purple, what do we do about classes? Are we then okay, now you absolutely, you know, we're in class on Tuesday and now it's Wednesday, you're back in the purple, you have to pull your kids out of classrooms and go back to distance learning. And then I have some other stuff, but I, I wanna go ahead and let you answer that. I'll answer that first question. So it's our understanding that if you open in-person instruction in red, then, um, and we go into purple, you can stay in person. But if you, we do I'm sorry, not hold on, David, David, yes. David, just on mute, and I'm having. It, yeah, I can't hear. Yeah, I can't. I'm having a really hard time with uh, people who are on the phone um, and hearing you. So Judy and Chris, I'm having a really hard time trying to turn up my speaker. So you're having a hard time hearing me. Is that bad? Yes, I can hear you better now, but yes, I heard it really loud because, and then David started rumbling around. <laughs> okay, I'll try it again. So um, our understanding is that we are in the red right now. If we remain in the red for two weeks, we can do in-person instruction. If after we start in-person instruction and we go into the purple, we can stay in person. 
However, it's not the same for the opposite. So if we're in red and we don't do in person and we go into purple, then we cannot go back into in person. Does that make sense? Okay, try it again. We're currently in the red. If we stay in the red for two weeks, we are allowed to do in-person instruction. So let's say we have our kids going back to school and suddenly our county goes into purple. We get to stay having our kids in school. However, if the board makes a decision while we're in red to not go in person, so we're still doing distance learning, we're still in the red, but our board decides we wanna stay distance learning. And then suddenly we go into purple. Now there's no way, if we go to purple, red, purple, red, and we start changing. You can't then go into in-person instruction. I said that right, didn't I, Angie Avalonidis? <laughs> yes, ma'am, you did. And the only, the only unknown factor is what this emergency break is that the governor can institute. But yes, you're correct, based on the most updated information we were given from public health. And I just wanna let everybody know, you know, we had on the slide, things will change. Once again, this is how fast things changed. On Friday, we put this um, topic of conversation on the board agenda. On Monday, we spent about an hour and a half doing our presentation, getting it we were in the purple on Monday. And so Monday afternoon, we went into red. And so on Tuesday, we redid our presentation again. So this is really new for all of us. Um, and so we'll just continue to see if we can stay on that red for two consecutive weeks. But the board will have to have a discussion of if that happens, what do you wanna do? What do you wanna plan for? It seems like such a nonsensical thing that they would have to then, you know, you don't have to get kids out of the classroom if you're in, if you go back a step. I, I don't, but I, we're not the state. I, I work for the state, but it's not, not for this. So I, I don't know. I don't understand um, why that would be, but. Um, you know, we're talking about this agenda item is the five phase continuum and all I'm seeing is two phases and that is nobody in classrooms and 100% in classrooms. And so I'm wondering what, I mean, are you bringing forward a proposal later? What, is that what you're looking to us for? Um, as far as, you know, do we go into two, three, four or just straight to five? That's exactly what we're looking for. We're looking for what questions do you need in order to make that decision at our next board meeting? Because what we've told the public is that we would stay in distance learning until October 16th. So at the next board meeting, the board will need to decide whether or not you wanna continue in distance learning for a period of time, or if you want to reopen to any of those phases in phase two, three, or four. Okay, um, and just last thing, I'll, I'll wrap up after this, but um, just the, I know you and I have discussed it and I brought it up before. Um, I'm hoping that we have some ability to maybe do a facility subcommittee where we can look at the preparedness of our facilities to host distant or uh, host in-person classes. <clears throat> Okay. And we, we can do a facility subcommittee. I, I'll speak to a little bit about that. Um, In-person classes, what the recommendation is, um, social distancing is recommended when feasible or when possible. And so um, if you take a look at that, in order for us to do six feet, our, our regular classrooms are 960 square feet. Um, and if we did social distancing between our students and our teacher, you could probably get about eight students in a classroom, um, if that were, were the case. Um, our Solano County Public Health official 
says that the real uh, situation is six feet between the teacher or the adult and the student, and that students don't necessarily have to have the six feet social distancing. Um, masks would have to be required uh, for our students, and um, we do not, we did not uh, purchase plexiglass as that was not a recommendation to have any type of plexiglass or um, uh, dividers of any sort. So that was uh, not something that was purchased. We do have a lot of personal protective equipment that was purchased. So we have face masks, we have um, face guards, um, we have hand sanitizer, uh, hand soap, uh, those types of things that uh, are recommended by our Solano County Public Health. Okay. Um, did that answer your questions, Bethany? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Jonathan, would you go next, please? Absolutely. Uh, so I, I think what's important to say here this moment is um, we've created virtual platforms to allow to Jonathan, you're I, I can you're cutting in and out. Go ahead. Try again. Can you hear me now? Yeah, now I can hear you. Okay. So the district is a priority in the beginning of COVID. Um, to create virtual learning experiences um, in order to help facilitate some of the concerns in the community. And considering um, the fact that the county is moving into a different phase um, regarding how to manage day to day living conditions and educating our students, um, I think it's extremely important right now to just remind the community that there are families that have a desire to send their students. To school, there are teachers that have a desire in the classroom, but also we do suspect um, the families that have a significant concern about their students returning to campuses, in addition to the staff members that are concerned. So our district has provided a, a different platform that allows for us to continue to accommodate the various needs, um, but ultimately at the bottom of all of this, um, our priority as a district will always remain with finding the safest, best way um, to return our students to a normal level of educational excellence and inter interaction because we do recognize, even from the presentation of Dr. McCabe earlier and some feedback that we've heard from parents um, and different staff that distance learning has been extremely challenging to go from what we have all known traditionally to be fundamentally education um, over time um, to having to go digital. Um, I don't think anyone would have been prepared for that. And I know that as a district, we did everything in our power to transition as quickly as possible, not to skip a beat. So I just wanna say in this moment that we continue to respect the position of various groups of families, um, their concerns regarding health. Um, but at the end of the day, the district's responsibility is to educate students and in the safest way manner, um, begin the phase of returning us back to the education environment that helps us to help our students to thrive. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, John? Would you like to go next? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, the, you know, I my my personal feeling is that um, you know, I don't want to rush into this. Uh, and I and I know once we get a green light in 14 days, if we get a green light in 14 days, you know, we could rush everybody to school. Uh, that would make some people very very happy and some people very unhappy. Um, I I think we definitely need to. Uh, you know, go with a little trepidation and uh, do this pretty conservatively personally. Uh, I, I would be in, in more in favor of, I, I don't know what our other districts around us are, are talking about doing. 
but I know that we all know that Vacville had actually uh, voted to go to school uh, before the before the governor shut them down or shut the whole state down, but four days later at one of their board meetings. So I don't know if that means that they'll be one of the first to go back to it uh, since their board was in favor of it at that at that time when ours was was not. But uh, I, I would like to see, I would like to hold back, um, you know, for a lot of reasons. I mean, I, I, I don't want to be the person that says, okay, let's, let's do this. And then, you know, our students get sick uh, or they become carriers, they take it home and, you know, they, they make their elderly parents or their grandparents sick. Uh, you know, that, that can be avoided. So I, I think that we should, uh, we, we don't know how that would happen in every instance when things begin to reopen. And I know someday things are gonna reopen and someday this will all be gone too. But that day is not here today. And uh, everything that begins to reopen, you know, we start to get a spike. It's just, uh, this, this the nature of it at this point. It's, it's uh, too prevalent still to, to ignore that. But uh, <clears throat> I would like to see some districts around us and I'm not saying that they will do that. But if, if we have a choice, we should, see what happens when our other districts around us start to open up. And I would like to lag behind them personally and see what happens. Uh, see if in 10 days they start spiking or they don't, or maybe nothing happens. Uh, I'd rather be safer than sorry. And, and uh, I, I realize there are some people that, some that think this is a hoax. They're gonna be uh, pushing for us to go back to school loudly and vocally. Uh, others, not so much. So it's, it's uh, you know, even from a public standpoint, uh, if we, you know, talk to the public, we're gonna get a lot of different answers. So we're kind of on our own on this, you know, from the information we get from the state, from the local county. Uh, and and so I, I would like to see us go into it slowly and uh, watch people around us, even if it's for two weeks or however a month, uh, you know, it's, it's better to me to, to do this uh, in a way that's cautious rather than jump into it and, you know, and regret what we did. Um, we could regret it either way, but, you know, making people sick is, is not the correct way. But anyway, that's how I feel about it. Thank you, John. Um, David, your thoughts or questions? Uh, yeah. yeah, a couple. Um, first of all, I heard, I heard the word requirement um, used when uh, Angela said mask uh, for students. So my first question is, how will you enforce that? You have to answer that because if, right now, if you've already got students not wanting to give up their cell phones and wearing their backpack, you know, you got students that are gonna be defiant. Uh, and since you no longer suspend for fine behavior, um, what will that be named? Um, if a student says, I ain't wearing my mask, that's one. Two, um, will masks then be required for teachers and who gets to uh, make that requirement? I'm glad Mr. Silva mentioned some of the wording um, that's being used around this um, plague, the word I'm gonna use, and that word is hoax. Um, and as he demonstrated, we, we have a parent we have staff members who um, are not taking seriously uh, the numbers of, of persons that have died. I lost a friend. Uh, he was 51 years old, no previous uh, conditions. He's a police officer in Richmond, um, California, and he died of COVID after spending 30 days um, in the hospital. Um, so. How do we make sure not, not only our kids are safe because being touted that children can't get it, which again is false, um, but, but, but outside of protecting the children, how do we protect our staff? How do we make sure that our staff is protected? Do we have PPE for everyone when we get ready to whatever um, phase we go into? And then finally, I just personally believe that we, it's not a choice we're going to have to, the, the opportunity to make. I think this choice is going to be made for us, as it has been, because people are not taking it seriously. And it keeps spiking because people are not 
doing what needs to be done to take it seriously. That's it. Thank you, David. Um, Joan. Okay. I, I would like to say that I'm really concerned as John and David are about opening up too quickly and not having enough security and gate arrangements made. Um, I'm hearing both sides of this story from parents and friends, and I, I still feel like we need to err on the side of caution. I, I appreciate it if we could go through all those phases in steps. Am I still on? Yes. Hello? Yes, you're yeah. still on, Joe. Okay. Okay, all of a sudden I disappeared. Um, I would like to see us go through those various phases that we have instead of just jumping with everybody going back in. Um, I don't see how we can accommodate that number of students with the, with the six feet distancing that we need to have to keep everybody safe. Um, the school, school rooms that I have seen on television, and I've viewed a lot of them, they all have the kids at six feet distances at least. And to not have to put our kids at six feet distance means to me that people are at risk. And I have a strong aversion to putting anybody at risk at this point, I guess because of my age. I just, I, I feel like it's really um, incumbent on us to be very, very careful in, in how we set this forward. And I'll, I'll just repeat what I said. I really feel like we need to go through all those various phases instead of jumping all the way to the end one and putting everybody back in at once. The other thing I'm concerned about is that I didn't hear any comment about choir tonight from our, our staff. And choir is one of the most uh, pervasively influenced activities that you can have to spread COVID. And I think it's really important that we look at how this is going to be done because kids, we have choirs at all three of our high schools now, and there didn't seem to be any kind of commentary about what's going to be done with them. But I would like to see that program looked at very carefully because of the uh, historical spread that has gone on with this in various church choirs where people, where the entire choir has gotten sick and, and a bunch of people have died. Um, it, it's, um, it's, a, it's a droplet spread event and, and it's very serious. So I feel like that's a really important area that, that was missed tonight in the report. And I'd like to see that looked at, but I'm, I am also concerned that we have enough PPE and that we have enough in case a kid arrives at school without a mask. Um, I, I don't want them in the classrooms without masks. If, if a child is gonna refuse to wear a mask, I don't want them there. I really don't because the, the possibility for them to spread this stuff is, is just too great and it's too dangerous. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Chantel? Uh, my only thoughts are that I'm just not rushing into it. And that when it comes to the point that a decision has to be made, I do hope we'll do what's going to be better and safer for our students and staff, as well as for their families, their loved ones. That's all. Thank you, Chantel. Well, I think I've hit everybody except for myself, and I. Um, can you please mute your phone, please? Okay. So um, I'm generally hearing uh, from all of the board members, and I'm agreeing that I don't think uh, we should jump in 100% right away, that we should work our way up because we might have to work our way down and do it on a gradual basis with um, looking at the health and safety of not only students, but staff and families. And of course, with the higher needs students coming back uh, first, I think, special ed, second language students, uh, migrant students, um, homeless students, we look at those high needs groups first as a priority and then work our way, I think. I agree with the other board members, work our way gradually through the um, stages. Any other comments from board members or questions that you may like to have answered before our next meeting? I, I would like to, if someone could answer 
what happens when a child refuses to work? I mean, at some point, we are going to be back in school. It may not be next month. It may be November. I don't know when it is, but I believe that whenever it is, I'm thinking that masks will still be uh, still be required. Um, and again, my my real question is: is is there what 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 is what is being thought about concerning well, um, in our, in our that guidelines that we have yeah. for, in our guidelines that we have for reopening? It does say that masks are required, and if they will not agree to wear the mask, they're not allowed to come to school. They be marked absent. Will they be? You know, you know what I mean. Will they? Will they be? I, I hear you. I don't want right. to get too deep into that. But if 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 they refuse to wear the mask, they can't come to school. We would have to look. <sighs> I, Dr. McCabe, do you want to answer this one? Because we have a couple of options. But go ahead. Okay, we've got options. I don't need to hear the options. Okay, cool. I mean, it's I'm, okay. I'm I think it's important. Go ahead. Okay. So I think okay. Um, Board Member Ice, and this is Dr. McCabe. I think what we would be looking at is working with the family, working with the student to determine why they're not wearing a mask. And if it's going to be an outright refusal to wear the mask or continue to, then we would look at other options within our school that within our school system that does not require the mask. So whether that would be independent study or something along those lines, I think that's what we would be looking to so that we can continue to provide an education to the child and try to minimize the the um, debate over the wearing of the mask. Okay, thank you very much. I'm done. I just wanted to make sure that we didn't set ourselves up to start expelling or suspending kids for willful defiance because they're not wearing a mask. Thank you. Okay, any other? Can I? Uh, Bethany? Sorry, yes. Can I just ask uh, for one more bit of information, at least for the next time, not necessarily tonight, but. Um, uh, Dr. McCabe, you said about independent study, and I uh, was wondering, so I'm, I believe we were at the semester period where kids could decide if we're in uh, in-person classes, now I can come uh, out of the uh, virtual academy or the independent study. Um, if we go back in, will kids have the opportunity to sign up for either one of those options? Um, you know, if their parents are not ready for them to come back to in-person classes. Independent study, yes. Virtual academy, I believe we did it by trimesters. So they would be able to, at the elementary, um, to go by trimesters. And when does the trimester end? I don't the have The trimester, I believe, ends the end of October, first part of November, if I remember correctly. First part of November. Okay, and that's to go out? It, out in, or in. Either. Out or in, either way. Okay. So what I'm, I'm, I'm hearing that the majority of the board is wanting to be very cautious in returning. I didn't hear anybody say that we wanted to do 100% TK through 12, go back in person. I did not hear anybody say that. What I heard is that there's feelings of trepidation, that um, we need to take this seriously and um, figure out how we can do in person, but also be cautious about our, um, our decisions and perhaps either go through various phases or um, target some special groups such as special ed, migrant, homeless, or English learners. So at the next meeting, our board is going to be asked to take action, and we can bring back a couple of scenarios. One of the scenarios that we can bring back that some of our neighboring districts are talking about is maybe having our, um, our early learners, such as TK, kindergarten, first grade, come back. We could um, look at an AM, PM schedule so that they're not all the kids there together. We can discuss bringing back our students with special needs or our, our migrant students or homeless students. We can bring a phased in plan where we start with some of our um, more uh, needy students and then talk about um, having that expand. 
Um, somebody asked about neighboring districts. I know that some of our neighboring districts have already decided to do distance learning for the entire uh, entire fall semester, so they're not even talking about in-person instruction until after winter break. We have other districts who are taking their time to make this decision and who are maybe considering some of those options where they're bringing in particular grade levels, particularly our early learners, um, and which are having a harder time navigating the distance learning piece. So I'm just wondering from the board's perspective what they would like to see at the next meeting for us, for our team to bring back for you to consider. Hey, Judy, David? Yes, go ahead, David. Thanks, Chris. First, I want to go back to our last board meeting where we approved um, the supplemental education services. That was, I think, really, really, really huge to help us bridge the gap of what we're trying to do and make sure that our kids are educated to the best ability that we have at this point. So I think that with that staying in place, when you talked about at the next board meeting, I don't know if it's proper to ask at this time, but can we hear an update of how that's going um, to, to, to make sure that, 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 that our kids are actually uh, being engaged and able to, to, to learn uh, dur dur during this time? And then for the next board meeting, I would I would just like to to, to hear more about phase phase two, um, and see how we can put some more concrete around phase two and or phase three. I know that with the learning loss money, we've been working on some state committees that you know those those, those categories of kids that you've just talked about those really needy uh, kids. We want to of course make sure that they're 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 addressed first. I don't know how that looks, but um, I just want to make sure that we go phase by phase, as Joan mentioned earlier, um, and make that a, a something that you can present to us, along with how things are going, if there is, is any such thing as an update. Thank you. Thank you, David. Any other comments? Okay. So we'll look forward to hearing from you next time. We'll move on to C, employee organization reports. Um, do we have? Any reports? I'm here, Nancy Dan. Oh, hi, Nancy. Go ahead. Hi. Absuda. Um, good evening, everyone. This is Nancy Dan with Fairfield City Teachers. And given everything, I'm going to set aside most of my remarks. I did want to thank you for placing the resolution on Proposition 15 on your agenda this evening. I am going to optimistically um, uh, hope that it gets a positive vote this evening. And I just want to say that Asuda looks forward to working with uh, the governing board and staff to find ways to share our mutual support of Prop 15 with the community. Um, I'll uh, set aside the remainder of my remarks till another time. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Nancy. Are there any others? Okay. Uh, D, student board member report. Uh, Chantel, do you have a report? Yes, I do. Thank you. All right. Um, good evening, all. Um, for my report tonight, I would just like to highlight the September 16th Student Advisory Council meeting. It was held online, and we had record-breaking numbers with 40 students from various grades and schools attending. It was really nice to see each and every one of their faces, as well as to hear what they had to share with the group. Um, we first introduced each other to the group and talked about why we joined the Student Advisory Council. Uh, we then worked together to create a mission statement and outline who, what, and why we were doing this exactly. Um, we also covered giving reports about each of our schools and introduced the three presentations that are normally given throughout the year. The floor was then open to anything that the students wanted to share or provide input and or give feedback on. And from this, we were able to receive a wide number of feedback on distance learning as well as experiences students and individuals have had so far this school year. Um, I really enjoyed the first meeting and I'm very much looking forward to the next one. Aside from this, the Student Advisory Council is currently looking to create partnerships with other organizations to find better ways 
or, or ways to better our district and provide students the resources they need to be successful in all that they do. And with that, I conclude my report. Thank you. Thank you, Chantel. We'll now go on to superintendent report. Thank you, President Heitrich. I'm gonna keep my report very brief tonight as well. The highlight of this last week was meeting with our student leaders. We had all but two schools represented. Uh, it was a great meeting. We were able to hear some of the challenges that our students are experiencing via distance learning. Uh, live in had some good silver linings to share. Dr. McCabe was able to go through our um, LCAP, the COVID LCAP or LCP with the students and they were able to give some really good inf or feedback on that as well. Um, talking about distance learning is very stressful, way more stressful than in-person learning. A lot of them have said it's been a challenge, technology challenges as we've experienced tonight with our board meeting. Um, and so that has been stressful, but they also are cautious about coming back to school in person. And we did talk about um, the various phases of in-person learning. We know that um, no matter what decision our board makes at the October 8th meeting, we are going to have some people who will be elated and some people who will be very disappointed. And we just want to um, let everybody know that there has been no, um, map or directions for this type of work. All of us throughout the nation are in this together and we just continue to ask that um, you understand and be flexible and um, respectful as we go on this journey. That ends my report, thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Corey. We now move to public communication. This is the opportunity for the public to address items that are not on the board meeting agenda. Public comment is only permitted on matters within the subject matter jurisdiction of the board. Do we have any public speakers? We do. Our first public speaker is Anna Patero. Good evening, Superintendent Corey, members of the board. Um, so this, first of all, when considering coming back to school, I want the board to take into account that we still have classes of upwards of 40 students in the class. So when you consider coming back in whatever phase you come back in, there'll still be possibly 10 students or 20 students in the class. So please take that into consideration. What I'm really here to talk about this evening is the MAPS test. About two weeks ago at the last board meeting, the, the teachers union president gave a speech regarding um, suspending the, the MAP tests, possibly suspend the MAP test. So I thought I'd do some research about that. And I realized after talking to a lovely young lady at the state superintendent's office by the name of Chelsea, she informed me that MAPS is not a state mandated test. So I'm wondering why it is that this district has it. First of all, when I was doing the research, I discovered that one of the analogies that they use was the map test was similar to, it's like marking, I quote, like marking height on a growth chart and being able to see how tall a child is at various points in time. If you're gonna use that as a comparison, if you're measuring a child's height, all we discover a year later is that the child has gotten taller. That is it, there's no context behind it. So my question here is, what kind of context, what assessment, what are we looking for in these MAP tests? Measurement of academic uh, progress because there's no context. I even took a sample test. One of them had to do with a parent taking their child to a shelter to get to, to, to a cat shelter to get a cat. And it was pick the best answer to this. Well, that is subjective. It depends on what the kid's relationship with a cat, if they even know what a shelter is. And this is for 10th grade. My question is for the board, is to really seriously consider the e efficacy of MAP tests, that requirement in this district, because it takes up days at a time. Parents are having a hard time connecting. I, had, I just learned from a parent this evening, they took about an hour to work out the technical difficulties of having to take a test with their, uh, talking to the staff here. So I'd like this board to really think about considering the efficacy of MAPS tests, and I'd like to hear a little bit more about that, what exactly it is they're assessing. And to listen to the teachers, they know their students, they know their learning styles, 
It's so much better than having to take this test that you already have something similar on the state level, and it's just redundant. So that's my piece for this evening. I'd like to know some more information from the board about what the efficacy is of MAPS test and why this district is mandating it. Thank you. Our next speaker is Michael Bloom. Oh, there you go. Uh, good evening. Um, Chris Corey and board members and everybody else, community members as well. I'm here to talk about the somewhat deceptive uh, celebration of the red tier. Um, when, as a foreign language teacher, I'd like to get a world perspective on everything and then bring it back to the local perspective. So when I look at the world perspective, the United States in relationship to COVID is the worst uh, statistically place as far as deaths are concerned. We just recently uh, reached a level of over 200,000 deaths, averaging about 1,500 a day. And that to me is very scary. When you're a teacher though, and you've been teaching for 13 years, such as I have, you have the excitement of wanting to see faces light up, to ignite, to develop relationships with students in a learning situation. And in the classroom is obviously the best place to put that. And we're dying to go back, oh, bad pun. We're, we're excited about going back um, into the classroom as much as anybody is. But I have a teacher down the hall who has a lung problem. I have another teacher who has a heart problem. And I have other people like that that are scared that asymptomatic situations, asymptomatic carriers, asymptomatic people can come in and, and uh, give the potentially uh, death warranting situation of COVID to them. And they're honestly quite scared. Um, how it affects us, how it affects people who have already had COVID, they have lifelong conditions that they have to do, the, life, the, the loss of sense of smell, uh, their, their brain works differently. There's all sorts of things that we don't know how COVID affects people on the long term. And that scares people. Now, a teacher is a battler, a teacher is in the trenches, a teacher is someone who comes up and wants to give the best that they can to students and they'll never stop doing it. And, and uh, they'll never stop doing it because they have an excitement about it. Even in distance learning, we have adapted, we have prepared, we have figured out ways uh, to find engagement when engagement is not willingly uh, viable for students, we find a way to make a connection. And uh, we've developed our methods in distance learning now. And then with the idea of going back into the classroom during this semester, and the fact that it could spike again, and then we would shut down and we'd go back to distance learning, that would be a jolt for teachers, it would be a jolt for students, a readjustment that would seem more sensible at the end of the semester. And to make a decision of changing in my time is up. I thank you for your Thank you. Our final speaker is George Quinn. Good evening once again. Um, I'd like to elaborate on a question that um, Board Member Isom uh, raised. Uh, the um, Sano County website has a uh, directive from the Public uh, Health Office uh, state, and it has eight exemptions to wearing a mask. And um, I think if you check just about any agency in this county, most of the people in the county are not following that. There's uh, lots of medical reasons that people can be exempted, but nobody seems to want to talk about that. That's a real... Um, um, invasions of people's uh, rights, and uh, it's, it's really a shame. Uh, I'm 
was alive during 1957 58 when there was a pandemic where over a million people died and the economy didn't get shut down like it is now um life went on people have an immune system and um, when they catch uh, diseases they develop immune system from that um, if um, people stay at home and they don't uh, get exposed to stuff uh, they become more uh, susceptible to the problems in the future and um, it leads to bigger problems I really think this thing has been blown out of sight. I can't speak for everyone because some people have better immune systems than others. But for me, it, it, it seems like uh, the economy has been uh, just totally destroyed almost unnecessarily. It's gonna be hard to bring it back. And I think more people are gonna be uh, ill than would have otherwise. Also, it appears that the sometimes the numbers get cooked because I, it's my understanding that uh, when people have uh, multiple causes, uh, they're all uh, listed as COVID. So like um, there's 2.6 people um, that have other things other than COVID, but if they have one thing of COVID, then the whole thing counts as COVID. So the numbers aren't exactly the way people think they are. And um, that really should be given more attention. I think the quicker we get back to business, the normal, the better off we're gonna be. The other thing too is that um, I think it's nice that people get a chance to see what's happening with their kids on um, the internet because they can decide whether they want to have homeschool or not. Because I think uh, it's better when people have a choice and rather than just having one thing. I think some people might solve their problem. So anyway, my time is about up and thank you very much. Okay. We move on to the consent calendar, 6A. Do we have any items to be pulled from the consent calendar? Okay, hearing none, do we have any public comment on the consent calendar? No public comment. Okay, may I have a motion to- David, I just move approval. Oops, David? Yes. Did you ha have a, oh, I'm sorry, pardon me. Okay, do I have a second? Second, Bethany. Thank you. Roll call, please. Or vote call. Got it. Chantel Martino. Hi. Mrs. Gott. Hi. Mrs. Honeychurch. Hi. Mr. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Richardson? Aye. Mr. Silva? Aye. Ms. Smith? Aye. Mr. Wilson? Aye. Sorry. Okay, motion carries. So we move on to 11 action item educational services. A, review and potential approval of the 2020 21 learning continuity plan um, Sheila McCabe do we have any public speakers on this item there are no public speakers okay um, Dr. McCabe good evening superintendent Corey board president honey church and members of the governing board before you tonight is the district's learning continuity plan. A draft copy was presented at the last governing board meeting and a public hearing was conducted. In addition, staff met with district English learner advisory committee, the parent leader advisory committee and all bargaining units. A draft copy of the plan was posted online and on display in the central office. Based on the feedback, staff made modifications to the draft plan. In addition to the plan being posted on the agenda tonight, were also all of the comments that we received from each of those different stakeholder groups and the public hearing and the responses to each one of those comments. One of the questions that came up from the board members is that on pages 13 to 15, the budget includes a column labeled contributing with either a yes or a no. This column represents the actions or funds that support our English learners, our foster youth, or our socioeconomically disadvantaged students. It's a function of the template that's put together by the California Department of Education. 
Once approved, the plan will be forwarded to the Solano County Office of Education. The county will have an opportunity to review and provide feedback. If we receive recommended changes from the county, the plan will be brought back before the governing board for consideration of the recommended changes from the county. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, comments by board members or if not, a motion to approve. I'll move approval. Thank you. Is second. There a second? Second. Okay. Is that Jonathan or David? David. David, thank you. Okay, roll call please. Or Chantelle Martino. Aye. Mrs. Gott. Aye. Mrs. Honeychurch. Aye. Mr. Isom. Aye. Mr. Richardson. Aye. Mr. Silva. Aye. Ms. Smith. Aye. Mr. Wilson. Aye. Motion carries, moving on to 12. A, review and potential approval of unaudited actual financial statement for the 2019-2020 fiscal year. Linnea Grindle will present, uh, but do we have any public speakers on this item? No public speakers. Okay, Linnea. Thank you. I am going to attempt to share my screen. Let's see if this, if this works. Great. All right. Good evening, Board President Honeychurch, Governing Board, Superintendent Corey. It's my pleasure to present to you this evening for your potential approval the unaudited actuals for the 2019-2020 fiscal year. So how did we end the year? Starting on the unrestricted side of the general fund, we ended the year with revenues of $206.8 million expenses of 156.8 million. Other uses, and this is primarily made up of the contributions to the restricted side of the budget of $45.7 million, providing us an increase in our fund balance of 4.4 million, giving us an unrestricted general fund balance as of June 30th of $25.8 million. Moving, over, so what does that unrestricted fund balance consist of? So we typically have some routine reserves that you are used to seeing. We have our non-spendable reserves that are made up of our stores, prepaid expenditures, and revolving cash. We have an accrued vacation liability of $1.5 million and a set aside for under deductible insurance costs of 275,000. We have unrestricted grants that will be carried over to the next year of $1.2 million. Some of these we received very late in the year and they were really unable to spend. And then we don't always get to complete those projects on time at June 30th. And so we have carryovers there of $1.2 million. Um, one thing that is actually missing from the slide but is included in the main document is that we also have uh, set aside for our CTE facilities of $1.9 million. After those set asides, this does provide us an undesignated unrestricted fund balance of $19.6 million. Moving over to the restricted side of the general fund, we ended the year with revenues of $31.1 million and expenses of $68.8 million. Our other sources, and this is the contribution from the unrestricted side of the budget of $38.8 million, providing us an increase in our fund balance of $1.1 million, allowing us to end the year with a restricted general fund balance at June 30th of $8.6 million. So this graph you see before you shows historically ended, and this is focusing on the unrestricted side of the budget, of how we've ended with our fund balance uh, throughout the, the last few years. And you can see we've been pretty consistent. And for this last, nothing has been consistent. And we did expect that we would actually end the year with a higher fund balance. With shutting down schools and our offices uh, March through the remainder of the school year, 
uh, a lot of our spending stopped. Travel and conference stopped. Uh, there was some utility savings. A lot of materials and supplies were not purchased. There was some professional development a lot that was not able to occur. Our graduation costs, uh, we weren't able to have those as well. So we knew um, that we would have some, some one-time savings and that's reflected here with that increase in our unrestricted fund balance. And then this slide just shows you a nice one-page recap of not only our general fund, but all of the other funds that make up our school district budget. And you see those listed before you. And as I always like to point out, if you look at the ending fund balance column on the right, you will see that all of our ending fund balances are positive. And with that, uh, administration recommends approval of the unaudited actuals for 2019-2020. Okay, do we have any discussion on this item? If not, we have a motion to approve. So approval. Second. Second. Stephanie, thank you. Ro uh, roll call. Chantel Martino. Aye. Mrs. Scott. Mrs. Scott. Mrs. Honeychurch. Aye. Mr. Isom. Aye. Mr. Richardson. Aye. Mr. Silva. Aye. Ms. Smith. Aye. Mr. Wilson. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. Going on to B, review and potential approval of resolution 09-2021, adoption of the GAN limit. There's no presentation. Any public speakers? We do have a public speaker on, oh, sorry, not on this one. Not, a, okay. So may I have a motion to approve if there is no discussion? Move approval, Bethany. Thank you. Second. Okay. Roll call. Chantel Martino. Aye. Mrs. Scott. Aye. Mrs. Honeychurch. Aye. Mr. Isom. Aye. Mr. Richardson. Aye. Mr. Silva. Aye. Ms. Smith. Aye. Mr. Wilson. Aye. Motion carries. Going on to 14. A, review and potential approval of resolution of support, Proposition 15, California Schools and Local Communities Funding Act of 2020. Do we have any public speakers? We do, Mr. George Gwynn. Good evening once again. I think this is going to be a really simple one. I think it's going to be dead on arrival. Um, I think the public is taxed more than enough already, and um, th this is a, just a, a mini step into um, getting rid of Prop 13. That that will be the next step if this thing passes, which hopefully it won't. I'm almost sure it won't. But the thing of it is, is I'm, I'm really surprised that. Um, both the uh, union and also the um, the board is wanting to get on board on this. The thing of it is, is the public should be able to have the decision on this, and they don't need anybody telling them what to to do. Uh, that's getting money out of this, and both the board and the um, the union are are getting a lot of money out of this. So. Um, if the public has to pay for the school system. They, they subsidize people that tell them what to think. And then uh, they have to pay more money when they uh, get more tax measures passed. We used to have two thirds for a lot of votes. And now it's got down to 55 to 50% 50 even in some cases. And you, you can say up is down and probably get 50% of some people to vote for it. So it, it's really not a fair game anymore. So uh, this thing really needs to go down. and. One of the things I think that um, needs to be added uh, after this has failed is maybe the uh, 
um, union for government people needs to go away. Um, there's a justification for it to, to get um, fair treatment uh, in the private sector, but when you can had, have uh, so much influence that you can uh, get things uh, that are special interest uh, for uh, the government unions, plus a big uh, pension you know, program, it, it's not such a good deal. So uh, really hope that uh, this goes down big time, and then hopefully maybe we'll see the last of uh, things uh, for a while. I'm, I'm sure um, people that have special interests will never give up asking for more and more and more, but uh, enough is enough. It's, it's time the public uh, got their money's worth, and um, we got enough things going on right now that uh, we shouldn't have to worry about things like this. Just look at the ballot when it comes out. There's so many tax measures that uh, want more to, to waste more and not really accomplish anything. It's pathetic. Public needs to really say enough is enough, and that's the end of it. Thank you very much. Madam President? Yes. Are there any more? Okay. So I can't see who that was who was speaking. David, I'm David, just making did, sure. Okay, so we're here. We're uh, moving for uh, approval on proposition. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, um, schools and essential local services in our communities have been underfunded for decades because of corporate tax loopholes. This is not a private tax. Many times, members of the public um, speak erroneously um, from the dais. Uh, and sometimes it's important to make sure that that, that, that erroneous information is, is corrected. With Prop 15, we can close the loophole to bring money back into our communities for schools and local services like affordable housing, workforce development, and instead of giving more tax breaks to large corporations, Prop 15 will give small businesses tax cuts and bring a large amount of money into our school district across um, the state and communities across the state, and I move approval of this resolution. Thank you, David. Is there a second? I second that. Joan Gott. <laughs> Bethany seconded. May I have a roll call, please? Chantel Martino. Aye. Mrs. Gott. Mrs. Honeychurch. Aye. Mr. Isom? Yay. Mr. Richardson? Aye. Mr. Silva? Yes. Ms. Smith? Aye. Mr. Wilson? Aye. Motion carries. Moving on to the next item B, actually B through N is review and potential approval of the readoption of the, uh, pardon me. B through N is uh, an item are items that were covered by the subcommittee, the governing board subcommittee, and I'm going to turn it over to Jonathan Richardson to talk about B through N, and I believe we are pulling O. Jonathan. Good evening, board colleagues, and virtually um, the governance subcommittee met on the 16th of September, and we reviewed several items to include our district vision statement, um, which is something that we've made a priority to ensure that we continue to stay relevant. Um, in addition to other items, which were recommendations, whether they were deletions, revisions, um, or just slight improvements to CSBA recommended items to help to co continue to keep our district moving forward um, and with changes based upon local legislation and government laws. Um, I would like to um, move for approval of items B through N, with the exception of O. I would like to pull that for a brief discussion and change, and then allow for that to come back for a board vote tonight. Thank you. Uh, may I have a motion for approval? Oh, I'm sorry, a second. Pardon me. Second, Stephanie. Thank you. Roll call, please. Chantel Martino. Aye. Mrs. Gott. Aye. Mrs. Honeychurch. Aye. Mr. Isom. Aye. Mr. Richardson. Aye. 
Mr. Silva? Aye. Ms. Smith? Aye. Mr. Wilson? Aye. Okay, motion carries. Jonathan O. Perfect. So item O, um, we are pulling. Um, there were some changes that were made to both the board policy and the administrative regulation. Um, just to make sure that there's clarity on the changes, I'm going to defer this to um, the board secretary, um, Madam Superintendent, that she may be able to provide the insight um, to the continuity that we want to establish as it relates to board policy 6142.7, Madam Secretary. Thank you, board member Richardson. We just want to make sure on page five of this policy, we inadvertently struck a, a portion that we want to make sure stays in the board policy. Even though this is also in the administrative regulation, it's important that we have it. And what it reads is, when a student in high school um, and is engaged in regular school sponsor, sponsored interscholastic athletic programs carried on wholly or partially after regular school hours, provided that the student has satisfactorily met at least five of six standards of the fitness gram in grade nine. And that's when you can waive that PE requirement. We wanna make sure that that portion about the fitness gram stays in. So the board, I'm asking you if we could make a motion to approve this board policy with that uh, addition. Otherwise, if you, feel like you need to um, have more discussion on it, you can send it back to committee. But this is the recommendation, not only of our staff, but also of our physical education teachers. Thank you. I move approval. Is there a second? Second. Okay, roll call, please. Chantel Martino. Aye. Mrs. Gott. Mrs. Honeychurch? Aye. Mr. Isom? Aye. Mr. Richardson? Aye. Mr. Silva? Aye. Ms. Smith? Aye. Mr. Wilson? Aye. Motion carries. Moving on to 15 information. A, review certification of provision of standards aligned instructional materials. Jen Rausch present. Do we have any public speakers? No public comment. Okay, Jen. Hello, good evening, Superintendent Corey, Board President Honeychurch and members of the Governing Board. This evening we bring to you routine annual information items 15A and 15B regarding the board's requirement to certify sufficiency of instructional materials for our students in accordance with California Ed Code Section 60119 and 604422, and California Code of Regulations Title V, Section 9531C, which requires the Governing Board to hold a public hearing. The district is required to certify that we have standards aligned instructional materials available for each student in English language arts, mathematics, history, social science, and science, ninth through 12th grade science laboratory equipment, as well as foreign language and health for middle school and high school as it pertains to this specific course. In order to confirm this, staff has reviewed the checked out materials in our online system and confirmed that students have the necessary books or, and or digital access and Chromebooks for the instructional materials. These agenda items will be brought back to the governing board at its October 8th 2020 meeting for review and potential approval. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Any comments uh, by board members? Okay. Hearing none, we will move on to two, 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 two. Oh my goodness. We're to the adjourning section. Did I skip something? 15, 15B. We got 15B. I thought Jen 15B. spoke about that. Uh, review of, uh, of resolution number 11, 2021 certification to provide sufficient instructional materials for core areas. 
the information. So, and Jen spoke to that with her comment. So now we'll move on to uh, German. Any board discussion on the on the B item? Then moving on to adjournment. We are going to adjourn the meeting in honor and memory of Janet Matthews, teacher and wife of Peter Matthews, hired principal of A.I. Jones Free School. And also for Whit Whitman, retired Vacaville School Board member. May I have a motion to adjourn? Move approval. Second. Second. Thank you, Bethany. Uh, roll call, please. Chantel Martino. Aye. Mrs. Gott. Aye. Mrs. Honeychurch. Aye. Mr. Isom. Aye. Mr. Richardson. Aye. Mr. Silva. Aye. Ms. Smith. Aye. Mr. Wilson. Aye. Meeting adjourned. Thank you.